Um, and thank you so much for joining us at Chevalier's Online. Um, we're really happy to have everyone here for a discussion of Glenn Frankel's Shooting Midnight Cowboy with Leonard Malton. Um, just a very quick housekeeping note before we get started. We're gonna open up the conversation for your questions near the end of the hour. But until we do so, we ask that you please keep your microphone muted. At that point near the end of the hour, you can raise your hand using the Zoom feature at the bottom of your screen and you can unmute or you can drop your questions in the chat throughout the night. And now please join me in welcoming our two lovely guests this evening. Glenn Frankel is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who has written for many years at the Washington Post. He has won the National Jewish Book Award, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and is a Motion Picture Academy film scholar. He's also the New York Times bestselling author of The Searchers and High Noon and is currently joining us from Virginia. He's gonna be discussing his newest book, Shooting Midnight Cowboy with movie extraordinaire Leonard Maltin. Leonard is best known for the Leonard Maltin's movie guide and its companion, the Leonard Maltin's classic movie guide. He teaches at the USC School of Cinematic Arts, appears regularly on Turner Classic Movies, and also hosts a weekly podcast called Maltin on Movies with his daughter, Jessie. Glenn and Leonard, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to see so many, so many people. What are you doing? Are you tuning in? Are you zooming in? Got to get terminology straight on all of that. But anyway, uh, I'm here and Glenn is a, a mere 3000 miles away. And uh, are you, are you uh, done with, uh, uh, well, you can't do a book tour. You can do a virtual book tour. Have you been doing that? Uh, yeah, starting about a week ago, I did four events on four different nights um, with four wonderful moderators, not putting any pressure on you, Leonard, because you'll be the best of them all. And, <laughs> and I really need to thank you and fa thank Chevaliers for doing this. I haven't done anything out in the West Coast yet. And uh, so I've done those. I've got several lined up. And, you know, as you know, I mean, a great thing about a real book tour is getting out and seeing people and, and being eye to eye and also getting new ideas and making new friends. And so, you know, I do this with slightly a heavy heart, but if I can't be there, this is kind of the next best thing. I'm sitting in a very luxurious uh, Hampton Suites uh, hotel room in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, because we've just seen three of our grandchildren today for the first time in about a year. Oh, oh. And, that's, uh, that's great. That's an occasion. Yeah, so I'm I'm feeling no pain, and yeah. um, it's it's not quite yet past my bedtime, and I'm just delighted that everybody's turned out. So let's go ahead and see what we got. Well, uh, I, I guess to begin at the beginning, uh, you and I met because of the the first film related book that you wrote, uh, which was on the searchers and the double backstory of that movie. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, and you did a great job because you told the real life story that inspired Alan LeMay, uh, a Western novelist to uh, create the story. And then after LeMay's saga ends, you begin with the John Ford movie and tell that story. Uh, and uh, a neat hat trick there. And then, uh, you wrote another wonderful book on High Noon, which has its own biography to, to be related. How did you settle on Midnight Cowboy as your next topic? Well, I mean, as you know, Leonard, if you've done High Noon and The Searchers, you're supposed to do Shane, right? <laughs> the other great 1950s Western. But, you know, Shane didn't really quite speak to me in the same way. Uh, I had stumbled into this kind of curious subgenre, where, as you point out, I, I'm, instead of just doing a making of the movie book, I and mean, that's originally what I thought I was going to do with Searchers, you know, just follow John Wayne and John Ford out to Monument Valley and, mm -hmm. and this glorious movie, which happens to be probably my most favorite Hollywood movie. But I discovered, oh, about four days in, that there was a, a true story lurking way in the background there of a little girl kidnapped by Comanches in Texas in the 1830s. So that sort of launched me on this much bigger idea. And, uh, you know, and the movie. Um, and it and it worked okay. I mean, I learned a lot. It, it was about a front, in essence, about the making of a frontier legend. What began, how it was told and retold by each generation. 
I enjoyed that so much. And then I stumbled right into High Noon, which had a, a historical context that was much more contemporary to the movie, which is to say that the, the Red Scare and the Hollywood Blacklist and screenwriter Carl Foreman's ordeal is he's finishing the screenplay and making the movie and he's called to testify before the House on American Activities Committee. Well, I, I wanted to keep going with that, that subgenre, but I wanted to pull it forward more. Um, the idea of doing something in the mid to late 60s was interesting, compelling. I remember my older daughter asking me one day about the production code and what it was and, you know, and I, we talked about it and she suggested I write about that, but that wasn't really what I do. But when I started thinking about the end of the production code and the rating system, of course, you stumble immediately onto Midnight Cowboy, the only X-rated film to win the Oscar for Best Picture. Um, a movie that was shot in 68 and came out in 69, which is to say very, very rich terrain in terms of the historical era that, that behind it and that it reflects in many ways. So I just kind of merrily stumbled into it. I, I had, as usual, I had no idea what I was getting into. I mean, I always loved the movie. I saw it when it first came out. I think you did too, or soon after. Mm -hmm. But I knew it was a bleak, complicated movie. Um, and, it, you know, so much was involved in the end and, and uh, exploring New York in the 50s and early 60s, exploring the gay arts community in that era and, and um, tracking down the novelist who wrote Midnight Cowboy, James Leo Hurley, who sadly is a very obscure figure now, but it's a great novel. And Jim was a young gay man who comes to New York like so many people do to find himself, to find his future, to be a writer with a capital W. So I followed Jim and I knew John Schlesinger, of course, the director of the movie from the UK, um, was also a sort of fascinating figure. And I just thought I'd write each, the two of them. And even though both have passed away, Jim in 93 and, and, and Schlesinger 10 years later, they were contemporaries in many ways. And by telling both their stories, I could lead us to this wonderful movie. That was the theory, it worked in some ways and in some ways it was very difficult. Anyway, the terrain was rich, the politics of the era are so complicated and interesting. The whole country was undergoing a sort of collective nervous breakdown because of the war in Vietnam and, you know, uh, and the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. New York was undergoing enormous changes and beginning to deteriorate economically and in other ways from its perch really as the capital of the world after World War II. It was rich ground. And as usual, I stumbled into something much larger than I had expected to. But having that movie really helps because you can always go back to the movie. And, and that took me through in so many ways and gave me, I guess, a vehicle, you could say, a story that I had to tell. And then everything else came out of that. So that's the long answer. Well, the long answer that we wanted. Um, Someone else could theoretically write a book about Midnight Cowboy and not do what you did, which is contextualize it completely, thoroughly, uh, going Obsessively. into, <laughs> to, you know, you're, you have to be not only conversant with, but really understand uh, the societal changes uh, of the 50s and 60s. Uh, the changes in, as you say, in the, the makeup of New York City and and uh, considered typical New Yorkers, the evolution of Times Square, uh, and then the, the, the gay culture uh, in uh, primarily in New York, but also uh, generalizing it in, in the U.S. I mean, it's 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 like it's like a multiple chapter by chapter uh, survey of American society, uh, and I, I'm just terribly impressed. I'm, I'm not trying to suck up the you. I already read your book. Uh, it's uh, it, it's it just covers so much ground, much more than a so-called than a quote-unquote film book is required to do.
but this is now your MO, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I stumbled into it, as I said. I, I have to confess, I've never been on a movie set. I mean, I, I don't really know how you make movies. Uh, my knowledge of Hollywood history, I mean, I've learned a lot, especially in the last 10 years. And of course, but um, I do what journalists do or what writers do. I try to find the people who do know about these things. I'm looking at John Bailey right now, you know. Um, there's so many people who have been so helpful to me, including you, Leonard, in just understanding the things I needed to know at the time. So I was not, by this book, I wasn't intimidated by that. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I lived in New York in the late 60s. I went to Columbia University starting in 67. I had my own, you know, I spent a lot of time in Times Square. I never, you know, uh, went to one porno movie, but I went to a lot of double features. I, I recall seeing The Wild Bunch for the first time in Times Square because mm -hmm. these movies that were opening at, at theaters on the east side, one or two for three bucks, which was a lot, were playing for 50 cents and, you know, on 42nd Street around the same time. And movies were were such a part of our lives and you know and what we did so that gave me a lot of you know i had a context for this because i'd seen new york in that era and and both new york both thrilled me and scared me to death and um it made it a little easier to figure out i thought jim hurley incidentally being a very handsome exuberant young man he's a guy who wants to be a writer with a capital w he comes to new york as i say in the 50s I thought Jim, being a writer, would take me all around New York in that era and the next era and take me all around Times Square through his letters, his diaries, his friendships with people. Where did Joe Buck come from, for example? The, yeah. you know, the, the, the Texas, te young Texan guy, handsome guy who gets on a Greyhound and comes up to New York thinking he's going to have a great career as a male hustler of affluent, older fe you know, women frustrated women and finds out of course that business model doesn't work at all did jim meet joe buck on the street Does somebody like that did he what is he joe buck to any extent i mean where did all this come from i never found out uh jim turned out to be an extraordinarily exuberant man but at the same time a very discreet one so i ran into all kinds of obstacles i didn't expect and that i cheerfully just traps that i walked into but nonetheless i had a basic notion of what i could do and i had as you say these two other books to give me solace in knowing that even if this one failed miserably it, you know i could fall back on the other <laughs> not that bad. but it's the history it, molly haskell once said something like that movies are the best looking glass into the past hmm. they tell you so much about the era they were made in and the era they reflect, whether they mean to or not. Yeah. You still, you know, and you can do all kinds of other, you can read books, you can do all kinds of other things to learn about the past, but movies have turned out to be an enormous way. And that's, I did, that was my theme, even though, even before I knew it was my theme. And, and that's where I've stayed, you know, having spent so many years as a journalist uh, and working for the Washington Post and other places, the history is, not the easy part, but it's the part I know I can handle. It's the, always the movie part that I find more challenging and, and more fascinating in lots of ways. Well, because it, it's, it's, uh, it's virgin territory for you. Yeah. You, have, you haven't been writing about films your whole life, but you've been an observer and a reporter of, of American life. And uh, so you're comfortable there. And that's why, that's why you write about it so well. Can I tell you my favorite? Uh, this is all about you and your book. But can I tell you my favorite 42nd Street movie going story? Absolutely. Uh, the, the friend who told me this swears it's not apocryphal, but true. He's watching a movie. I would never go to any movies on 42nd Street by myself. I went with, we did the buddy system. I had a friend who used to go with me to see films that were not playing anywhere else in Manhattan. And this guy is sitting there and he hears from the balcony, a guy saying, you're sorry, you're sorry. You pee on my date and you say, I'm sorry. 40, vintage 47. Now, how did you unlock the, the, uh, the enigma of uh, James, Hurley, James Leo Hurley uh, 
it, was it through just a, obsessively reading everything he wrote? Did he leave letters, journals, diaries? Are there friends who are still around to tell you about him? Yeah, all of the above. Um, I was very lucky in that the, the young nightclub singer who we met when he first came to New York in 1952 was still alive, living in Florida with his longtime partner and loved Jim deeply. And when his name was Dick Duane, he, he passed away recently. Um, we spent a couple of days together with his partner, Bob Thixton, who also knew Jim a little. So that was enormously helpful. And, and Dick turned out to be the guy who edited Midnight Cowboy and it's dedicated mm. to him. Uh, mm. Dick, who never went to spend a day in college. Uh, I don't even know if he has a high school degree. He sort of was trained in the MGM school, you know, finishing school and then headed to New York. He was helpful. And then another person incredibly helpful was Anais Nin, the great erotic uh, diary writer who first met Jim Jim comes out of the war as a young, handsome young man, um, barely makes it through high school, wants to be a writer with a capital W and gets into Black Mountain College. Well, anyone could get in this art school in North Carolina. Anyone could get in who had the money and Jim had the GI Bill. And he's there a month or two when she shows up, when Nin shows up from New York with her latest novel and gives a book talk and sits with the writing class for a day or two. And she sees this handsome young guy and uh, as was her want. I mean, she was very attracted to him and, and she met with him and they talked for a long time. And he was fascinated by her. At that point in her life, nobody knew who she was. She wasn't a famous erotic diarist of any kind. She was a very angry, resentful author who wasn't getting any of the attention she felt she deserved. And, you know, and that men were getting, younger men, gay men, all kinds of things. But she she liked this guy and she was fascinated by the way he talked and by his ideas and by his good looks. And they have a, a day together of talking through all these things and they both write about it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. If you go to her papers at UCLA, there's something like 80 or 90 letters from Jim scattered through oh, there. Oh my. And they are, they're not annotated. You gotta go searching for them, but there they are. And she writes a lot about him in her diaries. She was enormously helpful to him. He goes out to California and he studies acting for a while at the Pasadena Playhouse, five years incidentally before Dustin Hoffman later ends up there. Um, she, she's out there with her new young uh, lover, um, Rupert Pohl, right? Uh, Pohl. And, and meanwhile, She's got a husband back in New York. Well, she comes out there and she sees Jim and she encourages him. And when he gets frustrated out there and moves to New York, um, she helps him find an apartment and, and brings his stuff to people at the Paris Review. They had a, a, a friendship, an intimate friendship, and you can see it in the letters. And he tells her about things he's doing. Again, you know, careful man. And a man who suffered from depression all his life as well, um, at least self-diagnosed. So he's up and down a lot, but he's getting there slowly. He's got a play on Broadway within five or six years uh, for six months. He's got a novel um, called All Fall Down that's made a new movie in the late 50s, early 60s. He's, he's getting there. And so following these things and he's got papers in two different places. Yes, everything I could do. Um, it wasn't easy. He didn't help me. My fellow journalists didn't help me because once Midnight Cowboy is made as a movie and it becomes, you know, and the Dell paperback starts selling, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies with John Voight and Dustin Hoffman on the cover. Uh, Jim writes another novel and he's being interviewed all over the place about that. And they never ask him anything about Midnight Cowboy except uh, <laughs> how'd you like the movie? <laughs> And I, you know, the, the, the greatest thing he ever wrote in his life and the most important thing, and, and there's nothing, there's almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And when they do ask him a few questions, he's always dodging them, you know? Mm -hmm. So that Jim was tough, but at the same time, he was a wonderful character because of his life. And I should say, when you read Midnight Cowboy and you read the Times Square parts, you can see he was very knowledgeable about the culture, about how you hustle, how you avoid the cops, all of that is in there. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did help me in his, in his fiction to an extent, but it wasn't easy. Interesting. Now, the other, uh, 
if there's one other major figure, I mean, nobody's minor in this cast of characters, it turns out, uh, but the other major figure is the filmmaker, John Schlesinger. Uh, and how did you approach uh, understanding him and what he was all about? Well, in a sense, this was much easier uh, because John gave many interviews over the years, lots of great films to watch. Um, there's a full-fledged authorized biography by William Mann that's very helpful, well, very well researched. John's nephew was a man named Ian Baruma, one of our great public intellectuals, I would say, and very fond of his uncle, of his colorful uncle. And, and when uh, his uncle started to decline in health physically, Ian made it a point of vis not just visiting with him, but of taping him. Lots of questions. John understood what Ian was doing. It was very helpful. And the book called Conversations with John Schlesinger is a wonderful book, very intimate. Um, and, and John is very comfortable with Ian and, and you know, so I, I had access to so many things and so many people, Michael Childers, who was Schlesinger's partner for 30 years um, and has been the guardian of his legacy in many ways. Ian, who also wrote a book about his grandparents who were John's parents, you know, it was all out there and, and many interviews and, you know, things like 25th anniversaries of Midnight Cowboy, like the one you presided over. John loved Midnight Cowboy. He knew what he'd done. He considered it, uh, I wouldn't say his only, you know, his best movie necessarily. It was one of several he's very proud of, but he was, a. both men were exuberant gay men. Both led very colorful lives. Both were publicly in the closet until much later because, you know, sodomy was illegal in 49 of the 50 states until um, the 80s. Um, both didn't want to be typecast simply as gay artists by any means, but both left, uh, but especially John Schlesinger left a long trail and, and, you know, and a little bit also obscure. I mean, people know who he was, but he's not mentioned in the same breath as the new Hollywood, uh, guys like Martin Scorsese and, you know, and Coppola and Altman. I mean, you know, um, they're all wonderful, but I, I think Schlesinger belongs in that group too. And he usually isn't quite there, even though Midnight Cowboy is usually ranked somewhere in the top 40 uh, of great films. So it was fun to work on him because he wasn't, not that much has been written about him, but at the same time, he's well known enough that he wasn't hard to track down. Then you have the, the movie's producer, Jerome Hellman, colorful character, uh, and you have uh, the, the movie's the perhaps unsung hero or heroine uh, of the whole saga, the casting director, uh, who was never officially credited with what she did for this movie and for its leading players in particular. That's Marion Doherty. Uh, and she gets her... Uh, her, her the, the attention and respect and regard that she deserved it in a wonderful documentary called Casting By. And if anyone hasn't seen that yet, seek it out. It's, it's terrific. Uh, but she, she uh, unlocks a lot of doors, I would think, for you. Yeah, I mean, here too, I, I had heard of Marion Doherty, but I really didn't know much about her. The beauty of it that, that for me is partly finding such an interesting person who was a New York casting director, but at the same time, what her rise in New York said about what was happening to the movies and mm -hmm. the Hollywood system. Because, you know, as you know, Leonard, I mean, up to the 60s, when, when the studio started to divest of their vast staffs, 50s and 60s, they had their own casting directors. They had their own casts. I mean, yeah. All these people on contract and they would simply bring them in the ones other than the casting the stars, you know, they round up whoever was around. So Marion Doherty did all her early work in New York on TV and on the stage uh, and only, but she's getting, especially on TV, you know, she's getting this big index card file in pencil of every actor, every aspiring actor in New York. All these folks, I mean, one of the themes of this book is coming to New York. Who comes there, why they come there, and what happens to them when they get there. And it's a story of my life and the life of thousands of, of creative people. And Marion, because the studio system is, is beginning to change and, and, and fall apart, certainly the old, the old ways of it, 
Marion becomes more and more important. If you're gonna cast a movie in New York, you need somebody like her to do it. And she's wonderful at it. And so Schlesinger comes to town. He wants to make an American movie. He's already made um, Billy Liar and Darling and a lot of Hollywood and, and far from the matting crowd and the Hollywood studios are interested in him. And he's interested in coming to America, but at the same time, he wants to make the movie he wants to make and he's discovered this this bleak little novel a serial comic novel midnight cowboy and that's the movie he wants to make and after the various large studios like mgm say well that's very interesting john they actually said to him at one point do you think we could get elvis presley to play joe buck and perhaps do some songs and you know we'll get rid of some of this uh sexual subtext and everything you know, John was having none of that. And he finally hooked up with Jerry Hellman, who also didn't like the novel very much, but who really wanted to work with Schlesinger. And together they get to United Artists, the sort of anti-studio studio. studio. Mm -hmm. and, and then David Picker greenlights the movie for very little money and lets them go do. And they, and, Mar and they need these New York people like Marion, like Ann Roth, the great costume designer, like the various actors that Marion Doherty finds for them, these wonderful supporting actors. And she also, I mean, she helps them get Hoffman and, and eventually John Voight. And um, I just love writing about people like that. The movie, the, the book takes on a certain energy because these folks are so creative and they're at the height of their talent and they all cluster around Schlesinger um, to do this thing. And the, and the ones of them who are still, still alive or who have close friends, Marion passed away, I believe in 2012, but Juliet Taylor, who was Marion's assistant at the time mm -hmm. of the Night Cowboy and then became a great casting director herself. She's still around and she loves to talk about Marion and, mm -hmm. and so affectionate and respectful of her. It was great fun to write about these people because they're so interesting and they accomplish so much. Uh, where, where do uh, Marion Doherty's papers uh, reside? They reside down the road from you at the Motion Picture Academy Library, at the Margaret Herrick Library. The, all the index cards are there, all of them. I, I got photocopies of, Ho of Dustin Hoffman and John Voights, and they're in the book. Um, I mean, these are, these are cards. I mean, this is like, a, I don't know what you compare to the Dead Sea Scrolls or something. It, it's, <laughs> well, it, it's, it's like, a, uh, it, it is for a film historian. <laughs> It is yeah. not equivalent. I mean, you're. Uh, just things written on impulse, uh, scrawled in pencil. And, and it's like in the moment, it takes you right back to uh, her watching a Naked City episode in 1959 or 60 and seeing somebody she hasn't seen before and what she thinks they're capable of. Uh, as she did for both uh, uh, Voigt and Hoffman. And then you have those two stars. There's another pair, parallel pair of stories that you have to tell. And, and, and those are rich stories to tell. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Schlesinger didn't want either one of them in his movie at first. He thought Hoffman, he saw The Graduate. And he thought, there's no way Hoffman can play, you know, a, a disabled outcast a uh, homeless guy like a con man like Ratso Rizzo from the Bronx. Uh, Hoffman, and then suddenly Hoffman had become not just a big time movie star thanks to The Graduate, he'd become kind of a counterculture icon because The Graduate was such a counterculture movie. I mean, it was, you know, Hollywood searching for new themes and new and, and ways to attract younger audiences with more money. I mean, stumbled in, you know, got the graduate and that set a whole new trend. Well, Schlesinger wasn't interested in that. He hadn't seen Hoffman off Broadway where he'd been working for a decade, you know, trying to get a foothold. Hoffman never thought he'd be a movie star. I mean, he didn't look like Cary Grant and uh, uh, or Robert Redford and the idea that suddenly this guy was the center of attention. So Schlesinger didn't want him messing up his new, his, his low budget movie. But Hoffman of course wanted the part. He wanted to show that he could act, that he could be a character actor, that he wasn't just, you know, he wasn't just a celebrity all of a sudden. 
He really wanted the part. He dresses in an old dirty raincoat. He doesn't shave for a couple of days. He, he walks with a limp and he insists that Schlesinger meet him at midnight, you know, at the one of the automats near Times Square. And he hobbles in and he takes Schlesinger all around Times Square. And by 5 a.m., and you can imagine Hoffman doing this, right? By 5 a.m., <laughs> Schlesinger just says, all right, all right, I know you fit in. I know you can do it. You got the job. Uh, so that's how he got Hoffman. And Marion had, you know, pushed him along and made sure he got the, the date. Boy, it was even harder. I mean, you look now at these two guys, and you think, of course, they're the right guys. You got this tall blonde guy and the little short, dark haired guy, and they fit like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. They're perfect. Schlesinger didn't think so. Uh, in the novel, Joe Buck is a tall, dark haired guy. Hmm. Uh, and Ashley Ratso is the more blonde haired um, ethnic guy. Go figure. Um, he looked at Voight's face and he didn't see anything there. You know, a little dimpled Dutch boy. Uh, he wanted Michael Sarazen, the French Canadian actor. Um, he really thought Michael Sarazen looked exactly like Joe Buck was supposed to look. And incidentally, both Warren Beatty and Robert Redford were interested in this part. But Schlesinger said later he couldn't see either of them failing in Times Square as male hustlers. <laughs> He needed somebody who could fail. And so anyway, Voight really, you know, Voight really wants this part. And I think the portrait of Voight in the book may surprise some people who don't know Voight and who think of him as this guy, this, you know, Donald Trump's great champion and, you know, in Hollywood and all that. Voight was a, a, such a committed, hardworking uh, actor, young actor who really believed in himself and believed in the work and he read this novel at one point and thought, I, I'm this guy, you know, I, I, I need this part and this movie won't be as good if I don't get it. And Marion Doherty, who knew him, had a not so great experience in, with him on an episode of Naked City where Voight wasn't very good, but she saw things in Voight and, and especially, you know, she saw both as the vulnerability there and a bit of the charm, but also that there might be some violence under the surface there, that Voight could play someone who had a violent core or a violent mm -hmm. streak. And Joe Buck has that. Um, and, and so she pushed him hard. She was really upset that they did, you know, that Schlesinger wasn't interested. They decide to hire Sarazen. In fact, they even outfit him. They measure him for costumes. And then, of course, but because Sarazen's already signed to Universal, they have to go to Universal. And Jerry Hellman thinks he has a deal for $17,500. And he says Universal wanted three times that much. Low, you know, God forbid they should pay, you know, Sarazen a decent wage. They looked at the auditions. And every time he said they looked at, at uh, Sarazen's audition, he looked a little worse. And every time they looked at Voights, he looked a little better. <laughs> they hired Voight in the end. Yeah, and and, um, and 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 Schlesinger admitted afterwards, when he was at, he was asked why did, how did you choose you know Boyd and Hoffman and, and Schlesinger would say I didn't choose either one of them Marion Doherty did, and that's and that's rare, anybody for anybody in this business to give complete credit for an achievement like that to, to a colleague. Well, that's the way Schlesinger ran things. I mean, that's why these people, they didn't know him very well when they went to work with him, but whether it's Waldo Salt, the screenwriter, you know, who's coming off a long streak of, of difficulties in his life, uh, you know, he loved working with Schlesinger and, and, and the collaborative nature of it. And then the young cameraman, Adam Hollander, who's just, this is his first American movies from Poland. Um, he, you know, when I spoke to Adam, I mean, he just, you know, Schlesinger just gave him the opportunities. Everybody knew Schlesinger ran the show and everybody knew Schlesinger had his own quirks. He's a very insecure man who, you know, often would come in in the morning and say, this piece of shit we're making, I looked at the rushes last night, no one's ever gonna go see this. And, and, and people would have to, excuse my English, you know, people would have to, you know, put their arm around him and say, it's gonna be okay, John. <laughs> And then they'd go back to work, but they knew he was in charge ultimately. And he was uh, both very, not self-confident, but he knew what he wanted to do. And he insisted on doing it his way. And in the end, their memories of him, I think are very sincerely, um, you know, almost joyful, even though the movie was hard to do 
and stretch them, but they felt like he listened to them. I, I, uh, my wife and I attended the Mill Valley Film Festival, either the fifth or the 10th anniversary uh, of Midnight Cowboy. They had a special uh, screening and they had Waldo Salt there and John Voight. And I sat across from, uh, a picnic table from John Voight uh, one time during that weekend. And I said, did you know what you had, you know, when you were making it, appreciate what, you know, what was going on? And he said, remember, he said, distinctly thinking to myself, this may be the best thing I ever get to do. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, Waldo passed away long ago, but I, but Jennifer Salt, his daughter, who's in the movie, it's her first movie. She has a small part, but an important one. And she was with Voight, you know, she met Voight uh, when they started making the movie and they were uh, hung out together for about two years. She said her father always talked about this as the best experience. He was on the set almost every day. I mean, oh, yeah, that's, another, that's another interesting thread here. Is, is that he not only uh, was he welcomed, he was actively working on the film day to day. Yeah, he was essential and they treated him that way and they called him in, but he was there almost every day when they're doing the uh, rehearsals because Schlesinger did two to three weeks of rehearsals and Voight and Hoffman are in there improving, you know, talking about their characters. They're starting to build. I mean, these two New York trained, you know, stage actors building, starting to build their characters and reacting to each other. And while those taping all this on this old woolen sack tape recorder, you know, and, and then he and Schlesinger are picking out things from the improvs that they like, and they're writing them into the script. Uh, Waldo was, you know, very much sharing in that way, always coming out. He loved work. These guys were so terrific. And this is the other part of it, of course. I got, it took quite a while, but I got to interview both Voight and separately Hoffman, and mostly to talk to them about each other, about this collaboration between them and with Schlesinger and all this, because I, I just, it seems to me there are, there isn't a better pa pair of male performers in an American movie, mm -hmm. um, they're as good as it gets, and they and they did it together, and they were rivals, and they were competitors, but at the same time, you know, they brought each other up, and they both had really interesting things to say about each other. And all these years later, you couldn't get two different people than you know Dustin Hoffman and John Voight, mm -hmm. but they love being in the movie. They're very generous about each other and their colleagues. So, and you know, Salt was part of that, uh, and. So I don't mean to paint the movie, you know, in such bright primary colors. I mean, there was a lot of tension there. They ran out of money. Jerry Hellman fudged with the budget so that David Picker wouldn't know that they were going up to three million instead of, you know, 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, lots of things went on that were diff really difficult. But nonetheless, the core creativity of it was was quite amazing. It's uh, I didn't get it. Uh, I. I was a college student too, like you. I entered NYU in the fall of 1968 and it opened and John Schlesinger and Jerome Hellman were there mm. to talk about it afterwards. And somehow I felt offended by the movie uh, as a native New Yorker. It's like, uh, how dare this Brit come over here and paint this you know, terrible, see me see the uh, portrait of, uh, of uh, Times Square and all that. Who is he to come over? I don't know how I got on this high horse. I, I really can't tell you. Uh, and then I saw it again, I guess a couple of years later and said, it's a masterpiece. I, I you know, wh whatever emotional reaction I had at first was the sign, I was wrong. Yeah. And of course, of course, not only did, did it uh, gain prestige and ultimately win, you know, the Academy Award, uh, but it was a box office success. It's funny. Nobody expected this movie was going to make a dime, and for a while there, every time John and Jerry went back for to get more money, they got a little more money 
uh, but rather than giving them a raise, you know, more money for themselves, uh, United Artists just upped their share of the net because United Artists was pretty sure it wasn't, wasn't going to be any net. So they ended <laughs> up with 60% of the movie, of the net. Uh, and they gave some of that to Waldo, incidentally, and Jim Hurley, he had gotten a little of it, but the movie made a lot of money. It did very, very well. I think part of that is, again, the younger audiences were up for this kind of movie. Mm -hmm. The fact that it was rated X, and we could talk about how that happened because that's not the straight story either. But nonetheless, it made it a little sexier for younger audiences and, and mm -hmm. United Artists took, you know, uh, took advantage of that. And the, the, one of the marketing campaigns said, everything you ever heard about Midnight Cowboy is true. You know, that sort of thing. So that made people like me want to go see it. Yeah. At the same time, you have to really credit Hoffman because Dustin Hoffman was a huge star all of a sudden and his and his and a counterculture icon. And the people who are attracted to him are the young people who United Artists is trying to get in the movie theater. That's mm -hmm. exactly the audience. That was the future of movies right there. And they wanted to see Dustin Hoffman play this part, especially when the reviews came in and said he was really good. They were, you know, there was a certain pride that their, their movie star was not just a pretty mm -hmm. boy, just the opposite, but that he was really so talented and that he could go from being, you know, uh, Benjamin Braddock in one movie and being Ratso Rizzo in the next. So um, the, the movie took off and, and did, did really, really well. I don't want to give away uh, all the pearls that uh, <laughs> your, your book contains, but I'm going to ask you to spill the beans on one. Uh, I swallowed with I'm sure other people the uh, uh, story that I'm walking here pounding on the cab was a uh, an improvisation spur of the moment occurrence and the truth is yeah a little more complicated um, when you go to the draft script in uh, December 1967 there's the moment there's the taxi cab going into the crosswalk there isn't though the dialogue there isn't he, in the script he slams down the hood as i remember and he flicks off the cab driver and they walk on and so dustin deserve gets the credit for the line and i don't know if he thought of it immediately when faced with the you know i don't know the thought process or whether he thought that out before but the line is what we remember of course right and and that is his and that is his, yeah. but Dustin, the original story that this cabbie was just trying to break through, you know, beat the light and that he had nothing to do with the movie and all that, that that's not actually true. I, I don't know how to break this to you, Leonard, and then it was a shock to me, but some stories that people tell about the making of these movies are somewhat apocryphal. <laughs> and that's certainly I part semi-apocryphal, I guess you could say. I was privileged to host a tribute to John Schlesinger. Uh, he was still alive, but he was not well. And Michael Childers and uh, so, some other friends of, uh, uh, of John's decided to, to have a, a tri tribute while he was still alive to appreciate it. And it, it occurred at the Egyptian theater in Hollywood and it was an all-star turnout. And John Voigt, of course, got up to speak and, uh, and spoke very warmly of John and of the film. And he told one anecdote and it got a big laugh. And he said, I don't even know if that's true. <laughs> and it's the only, and he did it twice. And it's the only time I can ever recall an actor uh, questioning his own anecdote that in the 25 or 30 years since incident occurred on the streets or on the set, uh, it had been, you know, sort of wrapped up with a bow as a, you know, uh, as, as a real occurrence. And he, he no longer remembered if it was real or not, which is very candid. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But it was fun to hear these stories. We should invite our, uh, our audience, yeah. our viewers, uh, to... Uh, and Chelsea, you wanna you wanna moderate this part of the thing? 
would love to. And just a quick reminder for anyone who feels brave enough, you're welcome to raise a hand as Bruce is doing. So I'm going to let Bruce, you can unmute yourself and ask your question live or put them in the chat. Okay, first, uh, Leonard, I want to say hi, this is Bruce. I was one of the editors on Hot Ticket. And uh -huh. I'm, sure I, I'm sure I enjoyed working out very much. Thank you. Uh, so as a teenager back in the Midwest, in the mid 60s, I was very into um, Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground and would read e everything I could about Andy Warhol and the factory. I wonder if you can expand it all on his connection with the movie. Yeah, in the novel, there's a party scene in the last third, as similar to the movie, but it's, you know, the novel was written in the mid, early 60s, published in 65. The party scene's kind of a beatnik thing with bongo drums and, you know, a couple of guys dancing together um, and some sort of drug. By the time they go to make this movie in 1968, that scene has changed dramatically in Greenwich Village and around. And Michael Childers, who, as I said, was John Schlesinger's, um, this, his title was assistant to the director. He was involved in lots of creative little things that went on, important things. And Michael was kind of John's envoy to uh, the counterculture world, to the Andy Warhol world. Uh, and he introduced John to Andy Warhol and uh, other folks and Paul Morrissey, who was, uh, you know, making movies with Andy. And they got the idea, and Waldo also was involved in this because Waldo, among other things, was a great party guy, um, that they would update the party and make it much more of a psychedelic um, happening New York loft thing. And, and they wanted Andy to be in it himself, but he kind of shied away from it. I think he wanted more control over himself and his work than, than he thought he was going to get from them. Um, but he did open the door and, and with Michael's help and Morrissey's help to recruiting a number of the superstars to appear in this uh, party scene, including Viva, um, you know, uh, several some international velvet and a number of, of, and so they arranged to bring these folks up to the party, which was a loft that was created at Filmways at 100, East 127th Street. And they filmed there for somewhere between three to six days. I never could get it exactly straight. There was a lot of dope. There was a lot of sex. Uh, there was a lot of filming. The, the, and it, 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 they only used about five minutes in the end, but it added a certain flavor of what New York was really like in those days. You could be in a situation where street people could be mixing with uh, artists or, or you know, uh, Andy wasn't involved in the end. And Andy got shot actually a few weeks before the this, this, this scene was filmed by Valerie Solanas, it's shot very seriously. So he wasn't involved at all. And he, when he came out of the hospital and saw that Midnight Cowboy had, you know, had been made, he decided to make his own movie about male hustlers um, quickly. There was a feeling, I think, by Andy, and he expresses this in his memoir, Popism, and by some of the, fo the superstars, that they were exploited by Schlesinger, um, who really didn't want to do something truly authentic. He just wanted to use them. Well, that's certainly true <laughs> in a way. Um, it wasn't meant to be authentic. It was meant to appear authentic. Um, and I'm not sure. That's one of the few scenes in the movie I find a little trying. I, I, I just don't know where it goes, though it, it introduces them to, to the Brenda Vaccaro character, who's very important to the next scene. It gives a sense of what's happening to Rat. So, I mean, there are things that are going on that are important. But this was an effort to take advantage of being in crazy old New York with all these very art, artistic people and aspiring people and getting some of that feel into the movie. And in that sense, it adds to sort of what I would call the documentary air of the movie. John, John Schlesinger, among other things, had been trained as a documentarian by the BBC. And he always brings a sort of realistic feel, and especially in Midnight Cowboy, where we're out on the streets, we're doing stolen shots all over town. You know, there's an authenticity about it. And I think the Warhol scene is an, eff an effort to do that as well. Great question, Bruce. We've got a few more coming in through the chat. Um, one from Michael, who hasn't actually seen the movie, but is really enjoying the book. And he's wondering, Glenn, um, how you as a writer approach the writing of it to make it so accessible and readable. Well, 
that's a very nice compliment and I, I appreciate it. This is my fifth book. I worked for 35 years as a journalist trying to figure out how to get people to read my stories. Um, and writing is the kind of thing you, once you start doing it, and there are some writers here listening in, I mean, it never stops. I mean, it's something you're never good enough. You're never finished with it. Um, I really enjoyed writing this book though, maybe for the first time. You know, I've always found writing to be somewhat painful. And, and I think in the end, it's really is the characters. I, I do think these are extraordinary people. The fact that the movie was a bit more contemporary being made in, in 68 and 69 meant there were so many more living cast members and others who I could talk to. But just, I, I just love these people. Um, I mean, they're terribly flawed in ways and they make mistakes. Uh, Leonard had mentioned earlier and, and, and I never had explained in talking about Marion Doherty what happened. I mean, she wanted a single credit for casting Midnight Cowboy. She wanted her own card. And when she saw the preview, she didn't have it. She was like the third on a list of four people on one and she blew up. She was, you know, she had a temper. Jerry Hellman, the producer had a temper and they had a blow up after that. And Jerry, and she said, if you don't, you know, give me the single card, you can just take my name off the movie. And Jerry uh, did exactly that. And he swears, well, I knew she would come back to me in a day or two once we both cooled down and we would work it out. Well, they, you know, that didn't happen. They didn't work it out. Jerry um, says now, so many years later, it, you know, it's the one, the worst thing that he did and he feels, still feels bad about it. Uh, and Marion always felt bad about it. So I have to add that, but to write about that, to write about Jerry and, and Marion and these folks, the, uh, to write about Harry Nielsen, who's saying everybody's talking and, and Fred Neal, who wrote the song. I mean, these are just, uh, for a writer, there's nothing better than finding the characters and the scenes that take you through something, especially the characters for me. Um, and I love these people. I thought they were so interesting. Um, that I think that helped propel the writing because, you know, I just couldn't wait to get on, especially by the time I got to the middle of the book and it was all about the movie. And once Waldo comes in there, the thing just, it doesn't write itself, believe me, I know that, but it, 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 was, it was fun. It was the most fun of any book I've done. All right, we've got two questions from Jay that came in, but since we're talking about Marion, I'm gonna ask Matt, um, which is why didn't Marion think of John Voight initially for Joe Buck after she cast him in Naked City? In the Casting By documentary, um, she said John flew to uh, New York and begged to audition for the part. Um, yeah, well, Marion had an eye on him and liked him. Uh, and she was pushing him early on, actually. It was Schlesinger who was resistant right from the beginning and dismissed John Voight. Schlesinger first liked Keel, I think I'm pronouncing this correct, Keel Martin. Uh, they, they met him out in the West Coast and they thought he might be good at this. Keel, Keel Martin uh, later on be, had a terrific role in Hill Street Blues. He died very young, sadly, but he was terrific as J.D. LaRue, the sort of alcoholic cop. And Keel Martin's fabulous in that movie. And you can see that Keel Martin might have some of these qualities. But they said once they, they started filming the auditions, Keel Martin's charisma just kind of disappeared. He was young and inexperienced and he just didn't have it. So then Michael Sarazen was the one they wanted. Um, Marion wanted Voight. And in fact, when they're looking at, at the uh, audition tapes for six or seven people and, and Schlesinger's saying Sarazen and everybody else in the room is keeping quiet because, you know, Schlesinger's in charge here. Uh, and Marion gets up at the end of the, the seven and walks, storms out, and Jerry follows her out and says, what's the matter, Marion? And she says, you know what's the matter. <laughs> you, know, you guys are about to make a big mistake. So she was, she was Voight's champion, in my way of thinking, almost from the beginning. Voight had done a, an episode of, of you know, Naked City that he wasn't very good in it. He owns up to it. It's a big moment in the documentary where he confesses how lousy he was in it, and she didn't think he was any good either. But he says when he came back to New York to find out about Midnight Cowboy and he ran into her at her brownstone and he apologizes for Naked City, she looks at him and says, that doesn't matter, John. How about, you know, how would you like to meet John Schlesinger? And so I think Marion always had, had Void in mind for this. It's a gutsy thing. 
um, you know, Marianne would only bring often to these uh, filmmakers just two or three actors. She didn't bring 10 people or 12 people. And, you know, she and, and often the people she brought were very different, but very different kinds of actors. I think she believed in Voight and really thought he was right for this. And boy, did she, she really nailed it. I think it's Voight's movie. I mean, all power to Dustin Hoffman. He's wonderful in it. But the movie, John Voight's in every scene. And, and you know, Marion Marion got it exactly right, of course. All right, I think we have time for one last question before we say goodnight. Um, so Jay, I'm gonna take your second one. Um, and Jay is wondering whether the film might have been better without the flashbacks. Uh, do you know, Glenn, if the filmmakers ever considered cutting them out? Um, that's a really good question. And for those of you who've seen the movie, you'll remember these sort of black and white, for the most part, flash, uh, flashbacks. So they're really flash cuts. Some of them are, they're in Joe, they put you in Joe Buck's head. Uh, the whole first half of the novel takes place in Texas. And originally Schlesinger toyed with the idea of trying to tell that as a usual, you know, in the usual narrative form, but there was no way you could make a movie, you know, that would be, wouldn't be totally unwieldy and the, tech, the New York parts are so important. But, but Schlesinger always wanted to get you inside Joe Buck's head and what he was feeling. And so they adopted this technique and it had been used before. The pawnbroker is the one that I'm most familiar with. Whereas Rod St the Rod Steiger character, occasionally you're seeing these flash cuts of, from the war, uh, from the concentration camp. Um, and it helps explain, it's hard for the audience to quite grasp what's going on. We're not supposed to totally get it right away because sometimes these are dreams, sometimes there's, there's shards of memory. Uh, but at the same time, they give you a sense of the disturbance of the character. They give you a sense of depth. And so I, you know, no one ever told Schlesinger to take them out. Schlesinger was a, you know, he was, he was two kinds of movie makers. He wanted to be a popular entertainer. He wanted to make a movie that everybody wanted to see. But at the same time, he had a notion of how, what it should be, and he wasn't going to deviate from it. Um, you see that with the ending of the movie, especially with the violence scene with Barnard Hughes toward the end, um, uh, which I won't get into the give away the story, but there is a violent moment where Joe Buck and a lot of people didn't think that was a good idea because it would sour us on Joe Buck, but Schlesinger felt it was an important part of the story. By the same token, he felt these flash cuts needed to be there to tell you why this guy was so lonely and isolated. This is a movie about two isolated, troubled people who have never been able to connect with anyone in their lives. And they don't become good buddies. This is not Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but they form a sort of wary, slow uh, reliance on each other because they've got nobody else and New York City winter's getting tough and, they, you know, and they're stuck in there. And that's the heart of the story. And Schlesinger needed to give you some sense of the troubled life, especially of Joe Buck, in order to, to explain what this was about and why this partnership was so vulnerable and, and difficult. So I think they gotta be there. They, they can be confusing for some people. They feel arty to some people, but I think, you know, obviously. One of the requirements of doing this kind of book is to fall in love with the movie. And as you can probably tell, I mean, I, 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 I accomplished that part of the mission. Well, as much as we want everyone here to fall in love with the movie, we also want them to fall in love with the book. So if you're interested in getting a copy of Shooting Midnight Cowboy, you can find a link on Chevalier's.com. Or if you're comfortable in, in Los Angeles, you can stop by for some distance in-store shopping. Um, but thank you so much, Glenn and Leonard. This was truly, truly wonderful. It was fun to do. Yeah, thank you, Kelsey. And thanks to Chevalier's, I mean. And Leonard, you know, you've just been so supportive anyway. This was great. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Not everybody. Good night. <laughs>